Ding, ding, ding. That's another, that's another good cowbell. Honky Tonk Woman is another good cowbell song. Honky Tonk Woman. I forget how that the cowbell part <laughs> <that> goes. <laughs> This is the AT Banter Podcast, a balanced and entertaining look at assistive technology, accessibility, and its importance in people's lives. Join Rob Minot, Ryan Fleury, and Steve Barclay as they banter with people around the world about anything and everything regarding assistive technology and the disability community. Now, on with the show. Hey, and welcome to another episode of AT Banter. Banter, banter. I am Rob Bino, and joining me today is Mr. Ryan Fleury. Howdy. And our friend, Mr. Cowbell. <laughs> Woohoo! Uh, yeah, he, Mr. Cowbell is going to be sitting in for Steve Barkley, who is not here today because where is he, Ryan? He is out ice fishing. He is ice fishing. He's one of those crazy people that. The thought of sitting out in the cold <laughs> on a huge sheet of ice with a hole in it trying to catch fish is relaxing. Although he did mention on Facebook the other day that they got skunked, so they may have packed it in. And I'm not sure what he's doing today, but he's not here. Uh, yeah, well, warming up. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'd never understood that. I mean, I grew up in McKenzie, and yeah, I mean, I I saw you know people out on the, on the lake during the winters and they'd have the hut and yep. stuff and uh, I don't know I thought they were insane I did it once with some friends of mine and, and their dad it's really interesting I yeah. couldn't even get into like summer fishing like, even <laughs> that's boring but I couldn't imagine like sitting cold and bored yeah it's not too bad Ugh, no thanks <laughs> uh yeah it was uh how was your weekend uh, it was fairly quiet you know just a bunch of running around on Saturday and then Yesterday was, you know, household chores, dishes and laundry. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Trying to play with Reaper a little bit more and trying to get some audio stuff sorted out, but it seems to be working so far. And your weekend? Uh, my weekend was uh, was pretty good. Did some had a have a little freelance gig that I'm working on, so I uh, I did some work on that. Did you get my duo uh, sample call? Um, yeah, I did. I didn't know. Jet? I didn't know what the hell was happening. I, I answered <laughs> it, and I was just like, "Hello," and then oh, nothing you, happened. I, yeah, there was no answer on my end, so I just hung up and canceled oh. my account. <laughs> oh well, dude, you should have like. <laughs> well, you were the only one that showed up as a contact. So I said, well, oh, let's but, try try calling Rob. Well, you should have uninstalled it. You just no, I, I like, it was like it. a Saturday night at like ten o'clock, <laughs> and I was like, "What is this?" I thought maybe you butt dialed me because you didn't you didn't say anything afterwards. So I was like, "Maybe that was an accident." I don't know. No, I just thought I'd try duo. No, it definitely came through. I, maybe mm. I didn't. Maybe I didn't pick it up properly. I, I, I don't, don't know. know. It's weird. Just another messaging app to have on my phone. Hey Ryan. Yes, sir. What uh, what are we doing today? Today we are talking with developer Sean Kirkpatrick, who has made or developed a software program for iOS called Lodestone GPS. Interesting. Um, now this this thing's been around for quite a while. I I, I checked out the website and uh, he talks about developing it originally for Nokia phones. Yeah, that's when I first became aware of the product is when the Nokia phones were running the Symbian operating system and we had two screen readers, Tox and MobileSpeak. So it would be interesting to talk to him you know, about maybe the development process between the Nokia phones and iOS and just kind of where the you know, software is at now compared to where it was back then. Uh, what else? Uh, well, that, that'll be interesting, um, especially with, with how much is going on in the GPS market these days. Um, well, there's so many other options out there, right? Yeah, you know, well, for like, sure. So, you know, I, it'd be interesting to find out what sets Lodestone apart from, you know, the other ones, like just the Apple Maps. Uh, I don't know what Apple's using for their their mapping technology, but, you know, there's many options for Android and, and iOS. So we'll see where Lodestone fits in. Yeah, no, it'll be interesting. And he's local, right? I believe so. He is. 
but I, I'm not I positive. Checked. Did you? Yeah, you know I, I left it open for you to Look sound you. like you know what you're doing, <laughs> talking about, but clearly I'm the one that you're did the, the researcher. Research. Yeah. yeah, right. <laughs> I did yeah, actually I pull up is. my iPhone 5C last night and went to the app store and looked at loads, and I was like, 10 bucks. <laughs> 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 I don't travel independently, so it didn't make sense to buy it. But Right. Uh, all right, well, do uh, you want to talk a little news while we're... Sure. We're waiting. Why don't you introduce the news? Introduce the news. Introduce the news. Do 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 <laughs> news. <laughs> news. Beautiful. It's our new jingle. <laughs> news me. News me. <laughs> Excellent. You want the news? You got the news. You can't handle the news. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna have to come up with a with a sound bite or something. We're gonna, I, we said we were gonna do that, so I, did. I need to work. I need to work out a uh, a segment intro. So. Yeah, you got nothing but time. Nothing, <laughs> nothing but time, <laughs> and nothing but moths flying out of my pocket, just like in the comics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, laugh it up. It's real funny. <laughs> hey, I've been there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, all right, well, let's start with this uh, this news out of Google. I thought this was this was pretty interesting. So over the weekend, they uh, released a news flash, news article, saying that the Google Home sold over 6 million speakers uh, since mid-October. Yeah, it's an interesting article. You know, when you think about the Google Home Mini being on sale for twenty nine dollars, and I think the article said it cost them twenty six to make it or something in parts. Yeah, it's like wow. Yeah, you know, they they took a bath on it, but they've definitely got products into people's homes. Yeah, well, and that uh, that was their plan all along. I'm yeah. sure that you know the them dropping the price point like that over over the holidays was was a bit of a stroke of genius. I think. Um, well, maybe not. Maybe genius is overselling it, but it was definitely a, the sm- a smart move because uh, I think that this pretty much clearly shows that they're they're taking some big steps to really penetrate that market, that digital assistant market, uh, and it's and it looks like they're they're doing it. You know, that's uh, as they say in the article, that's they've sold a Google Home every second since. Sorry, not you, Google. <laughs> um, Sold a, a a Google Home every second since mid October. So yeah, it's crazy. And I saw that the Amazon Echo over the holidays was on sale, for, or the Echo Dot was on sale for twenty nine dollars as well. So you know, yeah, Google Home's going to catch up eventually. Well, I, I hope it makes me curious to think, you know, if if I mean, obviously they did that as in a reaction to mm-hmm. um, the the drop in price by Google, but. It'll be interesting to see what their numbers were like over the holidays, um, you know, and the fact that we haven't, they haven't really said anything about their numbers kind of leads, leads me to believe that mm, it's not as good as, as the, the Google numbers. Well, and I think with the Amazon devices, you know, they've definitely got more devices to choose from. You know, they've got the Echo Dot, the regular size Echo, the Echo Look, the Show, you know, the, all these other devices. Google's got three, right? They've got the regular Google Home, the Max, and the Mini. So it's to me, it's a lot easier of a decision to find the right product for whatever your use case scenario is. My only problem with the Google products, and the reason I have an Echo Dot, is because the Echo Dot actually had the auxiliary headphone-style jack, so I could you know, plug a cable into that and plug it into my soundbar or you know, a, a better-sounding speaker. Whereas the Google Homes don't have that jack, which I think was, you know, um, something they should have had. Hmm. But they do have Bluetooth, so you definitely can pair it with Bluetooth speakers. So it's an option. Yeah, I don't know if that's the only real advantage of the Echo Dot. Uh, I mean, that's that's not much. It's not. But, you know, I think, too, and I've mentioned this on the show before, you know, and Google's getting to this point... The Amazon Echo has so many skills. You know, if if you want to utilize your Echo to its fullest potential, there's no consistent way to trigger an action. Your key phrases are different for each individual skill on your Amazon Echo. So you can say, you know, a word, play such and such on Spotify, and that'll work just fine. You go to 
tune in radio, you know, your, your key phrase is going to be different. With the Google Homes, it seems like it's a more natural language process. Yeah. So, you know, that's why I lean towards the Google Home personally. And, you know, the skills that Amazon have are slowly transitioning over to the Google Home and, and Google will catch up. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I, I think that, you know, it doesn't take a, you know, a fortune teller to kind of look at the look at things and, and kind of go, yeah, I think that I think that in three, four years, you know, the, Google, the Google Home will be the, the pretty much the main contender and it'll be everything else will just kind of be the, there as an option for people who might want an option. But uh, I, I think Google's going to pretty much own this digital assistant marketplace. It's tough uh, to say. Years. Sorry, it's tough to say too because I saw an article this morning that Amazon is starting to roll out or is planning to roll out Alexa onto Windows 10 devices. Oh, really? So Cortana, look out, because <laughs> Cortana's already yeah, baked but, in, right? Yeah, but see, I, yeah, I think they're just. I don't think that's going to do anything. I, I mean, because honestly, I don't think I don't see. I don't see a lot of people talking to their laptops. No, you know, but maybe if you want to dictate a quick message or something or a reply to an email, maybe Alexa will have the smarts to be able to do that instead of just, you know, calendar reminders that pop up and stuff like that. You know, it, you could use your your computer as your your main hub for your controls in your home, your automation. Right. Right. So maybe it does make sense to have yeah yeah a sure assistant on your computer sure I mean you know and we've said this many many times uh, even you know coming up to this point which was when you're when you're comparing all these options um, really at the end of the day it's it all it's all based on what you want to use it for and and which one is gonna is gonna work best for you but mm -hmm. I don't know I I think that. I think that going forward, I, I think that uh, I think the writing's on the wall that that Google's going to just own the own the market. Well, and I hope so. You know, Google has kind of a bad track record, though, when it comes to releasing products and then you know bailing on them two years later. So, hopefully, the Google Home has proven itself already to be a successful device, and you know it'd be interesting to see what happens at Google I/O this year. Yeah, no, no doubt. Um, but I mean, uh, the the upside of all this is that you know the important part is that there is th this whole idea of a digital assistant is I mean the price is so good that it just doesn't make any sense for anybody with any sort of like say a, a visual impairment um, to not just go out and get a mini immediately because uh, it is it can be so handy absolutely. The, the thing that, that Google doesn't mention is how the sales were split up amongst the three devices. So, you know, whether whether it's the minis that are flying off the shelf, which I would assume is the case. I mean, because honestly, like 30 bucks uh, it would, did not make sense. If, if anybody had even a passing interest in getting one of these things, 30 bucks. Did you get one? I didn't. <laughs> but, the only, but to be honest, the only thing that held me back um, was the fact that I didn't want a mini. I wanted a home because yeah. I wanted to be able to use it as a, as a wireless speaker. Right. And the reviews that I read is that the mini, you know, the sound just isn't really all that good enough to really use it as a, it's actually not bad. It's really not bad. It's definitely not the full size Google home, but the Google home mini sound definitely sounds better than the Amazon echo dot does. Yeah. And you know, I was so close to pulling the trigger on a Google home max over the holidays. Yeah. And I started reading some reviews. I'm like, I'm not going to spend four hundred dollars. I just yeah. can't justify yeah. that yet. Nope. No, because that's more like that's way more expensive than even a, a sound bar. If it was, yeah. if it was priced around the same price as like maybe like any given uh, sound bar or something, I could see it. Yep. But you know, yeah, and yeah there's a lot bucks. of smart technology built into it. But you know, I'd be willing to bet we see that price cut in half by Google I/O. Yeah, hopefully. Hopefully, well, it'll be interesting. And I haven't checked recently. I don't know if the um, if the price has now gone up, back up to regular pricing or not. Um, I imagine so. I imagine that was only for the holiday season. Yeah, I haven't looked. But uh, I don't know. I got a twenty five dollar Best Buy gift certificate <laughs> for Christmas, so maybe I should. Uh, the Google Home Mini is not bad. I don't have it down here now. I brought the regular Google Home down. Yeah, I see that. 
I've uh, I've played the Google Home Mini speaker for you before. And yep. It's not bad. This is interesting too. It says <clears throat> Amazon uh well, okay, first of all they're they're talking about how uh you know, Google's actually making any money off off these low price points. Um and like you said, you know, the the device parts alone cost $26. And that's not even counting the cost of of developing the device, so they're they're probably losing money mm -hmm. uh, for these sales. But you know, again, it's it's all about market penetration, right? If they know if they can get once once you get one of these digital assistants into the home, you're pretty much guaranteed that that household is going to be, in, you know, in the Google ecosystem and will stay in the Google ecosystem. It's it's rare. I know you have both you have you have the amazon and the google but that's rare yeah and i think as long as the experience is fluid and easy to use the adoption will be much much quicker you know as i mentioned before the amazon devices have you know whatever it is 15 20 000 different skills and yeah you're not going to use all the skills you know you'd never remember all the, the the key phrases but same with your google home mini they're adding adding more activities all the time and for home automation, you know, I'm just really glad we have choice now, you know, and they're pretty easy to integrate. And actually, we did say that uh, earlier that, again, I was wrong, uh, that Amazon didn't release uh, sales figures over the holidays. I guess they did. They didn't. They weren't real specific. All they would say is that they sold tens of millions of, of um, Echoes over the holidays. Yeah, and again, they don't break that out into, you know, Echo Dots, Echo no. Shows, Echo whatevers. No. So, I mean, they do say that the Echo Dot is, is one of their best sellers. So mm -hmm. we're assuming that that's probably a lot of those numbers. But so who knows? Uh, I mean, who knows what the what the actual market looks like. But um, in, in terms of what, what percentage of people have Echoes and, and what percentage of people have homes. But... Um, I, you know, the important part from an AT perspective is that these digital assistants, you know, are, are really taking hold and are offering some real value to, to people with, um, with any sort of, uh, limited mobility or limited sight. Yeah. And I think, you know, let's throw it out to our audience. If you have an Amazon device or a Google home device, let us know and let us know how you're using it. Yeah. I mean, it, and yeah, it, it's. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, do that. Uh what else? Okay, so this isn't I don't know, the, I thought this article was interesting, not not really AT related too much. It's more it's more of a technology uh article, but I I don't know, I found it fascinating. I think uh, we can touch on it, link to it in our show notes. Yeah, I mean, for sure. It's pretty for long. Sure. It is, it is long. It's fascinating though. I I would recommend uh anybody giving it a read it's it's uh an article that is called your smartphone is making you stupid antisocial and unhealthy so why can't you put it down <laughs> and it's uh it's from the global mail it, it goes into into pretty big detail about um smartphone usage and the concerns around that and how you know there there are studies that are saying things like um the average um attention span in seconds has dropped by a quarter since uh around 2005 to now um and they, and they sort of attribute that specifically to um the smartphones and and you know how it, it, they're they are incredible distractions even you know even when um you have it turned off and you're it's only vibrating right um yeah you know they go into the whole reward um the, the dopamine the stuff. dopamine you know yeah. you get an alert boom you want to look at it oh i got a like on facebook or oh i got a new twitter follower oh you know there's there's dings and bells and whistles and is it twitter is it instagram is it facebook is it there's so many things now bombarding us for our attention that i think they said we're wasting about three hours three to four hours a day now just looking at our devices yep so productivity is taking a big a big hit. Yeah, I think the real concern though that the article has is the habit forming stuff. Mm -hmm. And and the 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 actual psychology and and the brain chemistry around 
how a lot of the apps are built. And it's, you know, it talks about how, how recently, you know, they have ex Facebook guys and ex Google guys, um, talking openly about how the, the, the platforms were designed to hook people in and to keep them Mm -hmm. hooked in and addicted and how, you know, those notifications, um, there's a real science to the, what color or do we make the, the notification bubbles? Yep. Um, how often do we push notifications? Um, the, the, the idea of, um, you know, continuing to ask whether or not you want the app to push notifications to you and just to keep asking and keep asking because they know that eventually people will wear down because <laughs> it, it actually takes, it, it takes mental energy to continue to say no. And eventually people will just be like, you know what? Screw it. Okay, fine. Fine. Push, push notifications to me. And, and you know, the makers of these things, they know that, you know, it's, it, it's a little insidious, I'll, I'll be honest. And it, it does make me go, yeah, I think my t- attention span has dropped over the, over the you know, past, say, five, six years. I, I do notice it. And I do notice that it does take me a long time to get back on track. If I'm in the middle of doing something and I get a text message, even if, even if I don't check that text message immediately, the first thing that goes into my head is like, well, okay, I wonder who that was. Yeah, you're thinking who, about who, it. Who is that? And so even if I don't answer it immediately and stop what I'm doing, my mind has already gone there. Like mm-hmm. I've already lost. I've already lost that that track that I've that I was on. Um, and if I do check it, then yeah, it does take me a long time to sort of get back into the zone again. And it's interesting. The article talks about how businesses are looking at how smartphones affect productivity and how you know what they can maybe do like I, I don't know we might we might not be too far away from some workplaces just being like yeah you know what when you come to work the smartphone goes off like well, you turn your, your phone off put it in your drawer you can look at it at, at you know at um at lunchtime you know schools are certainly um seriously looking at that yeah they're actually saying you won't even be able to use it during lunch or breaks yeah. Like once you walk oh, in into schools. the school, yeah. yeah, you know, your phone's unplugged till the end of the day, you know, you're disconnected. Yeah. And it's not <laughs> as a, you know, I guess the argument for it is that it's not, it's not necessarily a punishment. Mm-hmm. It's just, you know, you need a break from looking at, at it all the time and being in that zone because it, it is, it, it, it's showing to be as mentally draining as losing an entire night's sleep. Well, and you think about it, you know. Before the smartphones came out, if I wanted to get a hold of you, I'd pick up the phone and call you and talk to you. Or we'd arrange to meet somewhere, you know. The whole gathering of people as a social activity, that that dynamic is changing. You know, on the news last night, there was a girl who was saying she'd rather see how many likes she's getting on Facebook than worry about being liked by her peers at school. Yeah. You know? So this whole social media, whether it's Instagram, Facebook, Twitter whatever you know they are having an effect on on all of us yeah you know the interesting thing about this is that we're talking about this on a day that steve isn't here because it would be very interesting (laughs) to hear his his take on this because i think between the three of us steve is the worst for for that yeah um i mean you can't see him but you know i often will look over at him (laughs) and he is attached to the phone i mean that's sort of a running joke with between the three of us but it's it's very true like he is really hooked into into the phone and it's very hard and you know i and i'm as guilty uh i I don't think i'm quite as bad as steve but you know it's certainly guilty i mean i see the even if i turn notifications or you know I, i put it on silent if I look over and I see that little little green light flashing at the top <laughs> left corner of my phone and I know that there's some sort of a notification going on on my phone, my mind goes there. It's like, who wonder what that was? Is that a text message? Is that Twitter? Yeah. Is that Facebook? Uh, is that an email coming in? Like, what is it? Well, and I'm just as guilty too, you know, like how back in the day, which wasn't too long ago, 10 years ago, let's say, you know, you'd go for dinner with friends or a girlfriend or wife or whatever and you'd sit you would talk to each other you would enjoy your meal and you go on your way now you go out for dinner and you get an alert on your phone you're both now looking at your phone ignoring each other like that whole 
distraction has taken you away from your relationship. Yep. And that's having an effect on people as well. And I mean, I, I guess for me, the, the stuff that I really find fascinating is sort of the inner look at, at the, um, the social media stuff in general, like the, the ex Facebook, I think he was a VP or, mm-hmm. or president, yeah. uh, you know, who's talking about the, you know, the dopamine feedback loop mm-hmm. that it, it puts people in where they're just, they're constantly checking the phone to see, you know, what's going on in their Facebook feed, who's liking their posts, who's liking their pictures, Instagram, like it talks about how Instagram will withhold likes uh, if it feels like you're not checking right. the, the app enough. And it's like, okay, well, we're going to you know withhold the, some likes so that this person gets spun out into a panic <laughs> about their post. And then, often. and then, yeah. And then they reward that with, okay, well, here's the rest of your likes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now that you're checking it back, <laughs> like really insidious stuff yeah. where, and I think that's where the problem is. I mean, certainly the problem isn't, isn't with the technology itself. I mean, we have to say that for all this complaining, we also live in the greatest time Mm -hmm. ever because we literally have this device in our pockets that is like the, you know, the gateway to like knowledge beyond our wildest dreams a hundred years ago. Like the fact that we can, you know, we have like instant access to, information like never before in history uh that's amazing um but it is interesting that it comes with a price and that we have to be careful about that because uh it can have a real tangible effect on our on our brain chemistry and the way that that our society functions and studies are starting to show that you know it goes back many many years you know scientists have done research on you know rats and other animals where, you know, they'll just keep pressing the button to get food from this, you know, self feeding right. machine. They'll just keep pressing and pressing and pressing because of that reward factor, right? Yeah. So it's no different with us than our smartphones. Yeah, no, it's it's kind of scary stuff. And I think the scariest thing for me is that I don't see any real solution because I, I, cause you're never going to get the the app developers to to change because as soon as they change like if facebook tomorrow went you know what we're going to do this differently we're we recognize that that you know there's some some damage being done so we're only going to push notifications out once a day we're we're just gonna you know we're going to be responsibly social responsibility if they were to do that then uh you know someone was just going to come along and and make the app that people want and that's going to that's going to overtake Facebook. So they're never going to do that. They're never going to no, and I think cut people, the legs out from under themselves. And I think people need to be accountable. You know, they need to set aside time for their family and their friends and just have a time where you're disconnected. You know, I know myself personally, my cell phone is beside my bed. And if I wake up in the middle of the night, I roll over and I check the time. I don't look to see if there's messages or texts, anything like that. I just want to know what time it is because I'm totally blind and have no point of reference. But the phone is there and you have to literally say, I'm not going to check that, you know, yes, you have to to draw that line. It's made me think like, wow, maybe I should have just a day where you just like, you just turn off the phone and just, it's, you put it in a drawer. I'm not, I'm not dealing with the phone today. I don't care. Um, but then, you know, you go, well, but then nobody has a, nobody has any way of contacting me. Like I don't have a landline. Like, like, well, yeah, you don't. So, and I think a lot of people don't. I yeah. mean, I think that, you know, a, a lot of people have sort of made the switch over to just, you know. So it's it's a tough thing to do. And it also makes you really feel isolated when you don't have that connection. Because you, you, you lose a connection to all, everybody in your life. Mm-hmm. Um, you lose a connection of most people. That's where they get all their information. That's where they get all their news. See, that's why you need a Google Home, so then I can call you. But see, <laughs> yeah, That's right. <laughs> don't yeah, need your you phone. Go. No, it's interesting. So I don't know. It, it would be an interesting experiment uh, to me. So I think I might do that. I'm going to do that one of these days. I'm going to have like a phone-free day where I'm just going like, to, you know what? I'm just putting it away and just see. Just see what, remember what life was like before we had those. I, I've kind of put myself into my own habit where typically in the morning before work, um, I'll check Facebook, I'll check Twitter, and then I pretty much only check it once or twice throughout the day. Now, of course, when work is done, because I haven't been on the social groups all day, 
you know, I'm back on Twitter and Facebook just getting caught up again. But it, it really isn't that hard to put it down. It really isn't. Now, maybe it's just I don't have a, a huge social group. I don't have any friends. So maybe that's part of <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, see, there Maybe that's go. why it's so easy. <laughs> well, I think that we're also a bit of a different generation. Yes. I mean, you think about you think about the 20-somethings, you think about the millennials who have grown up with it uh, and they've never known anything else. Mm-hmm. So for them, it, this it's a much different thing to put their phone away. And I don't know, like, I don't know if you've, you know, uh, spent any time in, in the vicinity of, like, say, 20, 30-year-olds, but they also, like, they literally can't put the phone down. Right. Like, they, it, you know, it's very much like Steve. But yeah, no. Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, I'll totally be guilty of that. I will carry carry a phone yeah. from one room to the other if I'm at the computer. Uh, you know, it has to be within reach because, again, if I'm if I'm working and I hear you know the phone vibrate or I hear a, you know, a tone go off, I'm like, well, I don't want to have to go up and get my phone. Like yeah. you know, it has to be you know within reach at all times. And now that you think about it, man, that's that is kind of scary. Mm-hmm. You think back to, I remember the days when. It was it was sort of chic to complain about television and television viewing, right? They'd have these studies back, you know, in the eighties and nineties, where it's like, oh, well, you know, the average average person is watching yep. whatever five hours of television a night, and that's damaging to to children, and you, we just limit television viewing and stuff. And then it was the internet, you know, and and the development of PC. Well, people are you know spending incredible amounts of time on their computer cruising the internet and and that's a problem you this know, this feels different though well what i find interesting when they talked about the the watching of tv back in the day you know yeah i watched a lot of tv and oh, it was bad for you but now we've come full circle how many of us actually sit and watch binge watch four five six hours of netflix you know we're glued to our screens yeah but even more so like I guess what I take away from this article, and I think is is the main concern, well, not one of the main concerns, is that that's one thing. If you were watching a lot of TV, at least you were doing one thing. You were watching the A-team or whatever, right? Like you were, this is more like people are watching Netflix while checking Facebook, while, you know, uh, taking pictures on their Instagram account, while, you know... it, the list goes on and on, and multitasking is, they say, as heavy a cognitive load as losing an entire night's sleep. Right. Uh, what's that doing to our brains? Yep. So I don't know. This feels different. This doesn't feel, uh, you know, alarmist like those things maybe did. Um, and maybe that's just because I I can read this article and I can pinpoint five six things that I've actually noticed personally. Right about myself and how I consume it and and how I consume information and how I feel like my attention span has decreased. Yep. You know, it's funny. They have a chart in in the article and, you know, we won't go on too much longer about this because, you know, again, it's, this isn't really AT related, but I I thought it was interesting, but you know, they say (laughs) they show a, they show a graph chart and it's like what human, the average human attention span used to be what it is now and then what a goldfish what a goldfish's attention span is and we are actually now below a goldfish attention span it used to be we had a 12 second average attention span a goldfish has about a 9 second attention span and they figure now with the advent of smartphones we have an 8 second attention average attention span wow so yeah, it's definitely having a social impact. Yeah, for sure. In any case, uh, we will definitely link to that article in the show notes. I I don't know. I'd recommend anyone go and read it if you if if it's, it sounds like an interesting. I mean, I, I don't know. I think this stuff should be uh, splashed everywhere. I think that this this could be a real you know a real social problem, and and just goes to show you that you know the technology. It's all about how you use it. Because it, it is incredibly valuable and incre- incredibly important for people to feel connected in communities. We're always talking about how social media is important mm-hmm. um, for for the you know the disability communities and and being able to you know share information between each other and, and give support. But holy cow, you know there's there's a dark side to the, to these smartphones. 
and social media. Did you, hey, did you hear also, I saw, I saw some incredible uh, pictures out of uh, Massachusetts over the weekend where the ocean has frozen over there. It's so cold. Really? Yeah. There's wow. just huge patches of beaches that the, yeah, the ocean, it looks like it's the, the Arctic. Well, there's definitely been a cold snap over there for sure. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy, yeah. man. Weather is getting scary. Yep. I'm glad I'm as old as I am. I don't know, man. I, if I was 20, I'd be I'd be crapping because it's not looking good, folks. Although I saw something the other day that said the hole in the ozone layer is starting to repair itself. So. Yeah, that's so, yeah, there's that. Maybe we there's hope. Got that going for us at least. <laughs> there he is. I hear a doorbell. All, All right. right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. I'm glad you uh, decided to have me on. Well, I think it was, is it Christy? Yep. Yeah, Christy had said, you know, you were the guy we had to get on the show. And uh, it was interesting because I remember um, your name and the product we're going to talk about today back from the Nokia Symbian days. Yes, it's uh, been a while since that. But yeah, that's when we started this project, so... Yeah, so we're going to launch into it. So just so you know, I've got a co-host with me. His name is Rob Minot. That would be me. All right. Okay, hello. And our other co-host, Mr. Cowbell. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Steve got us a, Steve got the podcast, the Cowbell, uh, for Christmas. And so... Uh, ah, yes. Is it one of those Olympic 2010 Cowbells? Uh, you know what? Hold on. I'm going to check. It is the brand. I don't think it's Olympic. No, probably not. Oh, yeah, I bought Steve's, one of those. Steve's that thing's really loud. Yeah, no, Steve's cheap. He just, I'm sure this was like <laughs> three bucks on, on Amazon. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, yeah, so, okay, well, let's, you know what, uh, where do you want to start, Ryan? Should we, should we go back into the... Well, let's first find out, you know, a little bit about Sean and kind of maybe how long he's been, you know, a developer. All right. Um, I've been, a, well, a programmer in everything for, well, do I want to say... Since the mid '80s, that really makes me sound kind of old. <laughs> I've kind of been into a bit of everything, you know, like back in the DOS days and assembler and all that. And then in the '90s, of course, moving into Linux programming and home automation gear and um, all sorts of experimental things. And then in the up around 2004 or so, I got into the Nokia development and the Sim for the Symbian days. And then um, now in I don't know, a few years back, got into the actual iPhone development. So I'm always playing around with new technologies, it seems. So programming and development has always been, obviously, a passion of yours. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm always experimenting with something. Uh, now, you are visually impaired, is that correct? Yep, totally blind. I have a bit of light perception and can see some uh, shapes and maybe colors if they're really distinct, but not really. So, yeah, I'm basically totally blind. So how how have you found developing for, say, Symbian as opposed to developing for, for iOS? Uh, is it, is one, was one easier than the other? Um, well, Symbian was, how do I put this into actual good terms here? Symbian was a horrible operating system. <laughs> That's <laughs> so, good terms. It was just awful. It was like, if you took all the mistakes of Windows and DOS and stuck them on a cell phone. Oh, wow. Symbian. So it's, it, it wasn't so much that the development was, because it was all done by text. It could be run off the command line and done in text editors and things. So that part of it was easy. But the actual getting certain things done could be almost like an uphill climb on a glass wall with someone pouring water all over you. Right. It's a bit like that. Well, Whereas... It's... The iPhone, of course, you do the development in, in Xcode for the most part, which is a graphical IDE. And you have to consider other things now because it's, it's only a touch screen. So you have to consider all the visual layouts and interfacing and things. So it's a bit challenging. And then there, it also, the way Apple does things can be a bit strange, to say the least, sometimes. So do you have sighted assistance then to help you with the graphical elements and layouts? No, not really, actually. So I don't know how Lodestone actually looks visually, but so far nobody's complained, and <laughs> usually Apple doesn't let you lay out something that will look too bad because it has a thing called Interface Builder, and it's basically you 
position elements on the screen where you want them and you can sort of tell where they are by their coordinates. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's interesting going back, you know, thinking about the, the old Nokia Symbian phones and the Windows mobile devices, you know, and how kind of revolutionary they were with the talk screen reader and mobile speak. And then, you know, within 10 years, here we are with smartphones and, you know, being able to develop for iOS and, you know, basically create any sort of app that you can think of. Um, and develop a niche product for yourself. So why don't you tell us about Lodestone and, you know, kind of where that idea came from. All right. Well, the idea for the accessible GPS came from a friend of mine who I always thought was pretty strange. He was almost like a human GPS, so I don't know why he wanted one. <laughs> but he was back in maybe, I don't know, 02, 03, he, was, he came to me with the idea of maybe retrofitting an existing handheld GPS receiver, maybe with a hardware synth or something, get it to speak. And so I, we were sort of kicking around that idea. But then the accessible smartphones came along, the Nokia's of talks, and we're like, all right, let's program for these because people are carrying around their phones. It's small, it's off the shelf, and I don't have to build any hardware, which is always good. So he bought me the receiver, the, deep, the external Bluetooth receiver and the Nokia cell phone and just said, all right, um, let's see if you can write a GPS program. So I learned the Symbian operating system and started coding, basically. And at that point, there wasn't a lot of accessible GPS systems available for the blind. There was the Trekker, as far as I know, which was rather expensive. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, we were sort of toying around with Lodestone. We hadn't really had a name for it for the first couple of years. And then at some point we thought we'd make the program open source and put it online since we were getting use out of it and make it a freeware program. So in uh, about June of 2006, we fired up the website and turned it live. And, um, yeah, we turned it loose on the world, basically. And so that was for the Symbian OS. So yes, how, was. how has that development kind of led you into development for Lodestone on iOS? What made you choose iOS over, you know, Android or? Well, it was, um, again, it was, uh, you know, come around 2013 or so, the, the same like, person was like, okay, now I'm on the iPhone. <laughs> and well, the, the, the Symbian support was abruptly killed when Microsoft bought Nokia. So right. the development for that was going to go no further at all. And so it was a question of which of these weird touch devices do we now pick? And at the time, uh, so we, you know, I, he again bought me a used iPhone and said, could you program this? And for the first little while, the answer was no, because in order to play in Apple's universe, you need Apple products. So you need, uh, of course, an up-to-date Mac computer, and that was a fair bit of money. So around 2015 or so, I started a fundraising campaign to try to get the hardware needed for that and the reason I picked iPhone was basically for one I had one and then I was trying to get um, input about Android and the various you know the other operating systems and it just seemed like the iPhone at the time was a lot more developed speech wise anyway right because the Android with all the different hardware it was hard to tell exactly the consistency of you know what you would get on the platform and I can tell you this the Android users on the list hated this decision, really <laughs> hated it. It was like blaspheming in a church or something. I tell you, they were angry, but there was no lodestone for Android. So do you have plans to develop for Android? Um, yes, I do. At some point, I actually, a friend of mine this Christmas actually just said, here, have an Android tablet I'm not using. I'm like, <laughs> okay, I'll take that, um, you know, I'll see what I can do. So now I have one I can play with, which is nice. So I'll try playing around with the development. That might be a lot easier said than done. There's not going to be an Android version tomorrow or anything. Right. But at some point, yes, I would like to actually develop for that and have it in both markets, of course. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, with iOS, you kind of, you know, are, are in this walled garden and, you know, one device works the same as the other device. Whereas with Android, developing or de depending on what version of the Android OS you're on, you know, if you're using Samsung devices, you've got TouchWiz. If you're using LG, you're using whatever their interface is. If you're using a Google Pixel while well, you're using their interface, um, you know, so that consistency has got to be a real issue, I would think. Yeah, that was the thing I was finding for when I was trying to figure out what I would like to develop for, because I noticed the same thing in the Nokia Symbian days. If you had the first edition or third edition or fifth edition, Symbian developing turned out differently, and you had to do all sorts of tricks to get everything to play nicely together. 
So I really didn't want to have to do that again if I could avoid it. And with iOS, yeah, it is pretty consistent across the line. But Android, on the other hand, I guess you, if you like things that can be configured and customizable, then that's kind of the way to go for that. Well, and you know, Rob and myself, we, we've had iOS devices in the past, and we're both Android users now. Um, I'm totally blind, and, and Rob has sight. But right. you know, the, the one nice thing I really like about Android is the multitude of choice you have in, in phones, manufacturers, screen sizes, whatever. Um, and right. Apple, Apple is starting to, I think, pick up on that, you know, with the five S's and C's and X's and pluses and, you know, whatever <laughs> yeah, they're it, doing it, now, right? So It seems like, yeah, with screen size lately on these phones, you can have big or you can have even bigger. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Whereas I would personally like something a little smaller since I don't need the screen as such. Right. <laughs> now... <clears throat> What about, you know, obviously over the past 10 years, the other thing that's really changed in terms of, of uh, hardware and the technology is GPS itself. Um, you know, right. those days of, of trying to connect, uh, like I remember, you know, sitting next to Ryan, you know, trying to connect a Bluetooth GPS, a GPS receiver, receiver to yeah. a Nokia phone. Right. And that was not a fun process or an easy process. Um, these days, I mean, we're just, you know, we're, we're, you just turn you know, on your turn phone, on your and, phone go. and you're, you're good to go. Um, yeah, you don't have to, you don't have to sort of jump through those hoops anymore. Um, well, no, the phone is tracking you whether you want to or not. <laughs> that's, that's right. Sometimes <laughs> a little good, too. Because when you fire up your GPS app, yeah, you're not sitting there waiting for signals and trying right. to connect. And it actually, that part of it has smoothed out tremendously over the last 10 years or so now now from a development point of view though is has that made your life easier it kind of has because yeah apple provides a nice api to this location system back in the symbian days you basically had to read the raw data coming off of the bluetooth receiver interpret it and process it as you would and use it but whereas apple now it doesn't you don't even get to really know what the location systems are doing it just feeds you your coordinates and your speed and heading and all that, and it uh, it actually is easier to use that way. But in some ways, you lose some information. For example, you don't know how many GPS satellites you may have at the time because that information isn't provided by the API. Hmm. So one of the issues that some of the standalone GPS products had earlier on, and maybe still do, uh, I don't use one, but like you just mentioned, being able to detect the number of satellites which would also right. determine your accuracy level of, you know, getting you from point A to point B. Um, right. Is is that still an issue with our smartphones, or are the GPS modules just way more accurate? It seems like they are. Now, this is, again, the phone itself kind of, it gives you an accuracy in meters number, so I don't know if it makes it up from its own like, calculations or how it gets it. But according to at least what my phone reports, in a good environment, it says I have an accuracy of about five meters, which is pretty good for pedestrian use. Right. But if, if I were to look at it right now on my phone, it would probably have, since it would be indoors, it might say accuracy of either 65 or 30 meters, which indoors, again, isn't too bad. But yeah, outdoors, that goes up to between five and 10. So they're actually quite good for what they are. Right. Although in terms of, you know, sort of an app that is being used as, as a mobility aid, you know, six meters can be a pretty large uh, amount. Yes, it can be. You can be about, that's maybe, what, 20 feet, give or take? Right. So that's, but it's not bad. It will get you to the building, as, you know, right. as we kind of used to say on the lodestone list, it would... The system would get you basically to the building, but you'd still have to use your O&M skills to find the door. Right, right, sure. Yeah. And if you're lucky, it gets you right to, like, spot on target. And sometimes it will if it's having a good day. But, yeah, a lot of the time it will get you pretty much into the location, and then you have to figure out those last few feet. Now, do you see a time when that problem is going to be solved? Like, is, is, the, is the technology going to get, get to a point where you can literally go door to door? They... Actually, I was reading up a little bit about this last night, actually, because a user asked something similar on, like, about Lodestone. And they say that the Galileo system that the European Union is building will have an accuracy of one meter for normal consumer wow. applications. Right. And 
but that's supposed to be opera- operational around 2020, they figure, full operational status. Hmm. So that would be pretty good. A meter would be, yeah, that would be about as good as you're going to get. And then I guess the commercial levels, they figure if you pay for access to the system, it would be down to one centimeter accurate. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah, and I know, you know, we've had we've had people on from HumanWare, and the new Victor Reader Trek has, does have support for the new Galileo system once it gets rolled out. So, right. you know, and they're also, I believe, using, you know, TomTom Maps and um, the, right. with, with so many other different GPS options on the market now. You know, what oh, is, yeah, there's tons of them. Yeah, what is your, you know, mapping technology, if you can share that? It's, um, there's a, it's called PointShare, and it's a system that it's, uh, it's for Lodestone users, and it's, so the primary data source is OpenStreetMap. And so what this system does is, is I have a server here that sucks in the entire OpenStreetMap database, and then it also combines it with information from other sources, such as Lodestone users themselves can upload and share their points to the system. And I've been able to merge, let's say for the Vancouver area, local city data sources and transit data sources and any other public information I'm able to come across. And then it can all, and then also the machine has been able to calculate all 27 million intersections on earth from the open street map <laughs> data. So it, yeah, and then with all this, it's a huge database of points that are globally covered now. So then if it's not so much <clears throat> map based, excuse me, um, like, you know, it wasn't too long ago where, you know, with our standalone GPS or even our smartphones, you know, we only had the storage capacity to store, you know, a provincial map or a state map. You know, now right. we have the capacity to store, you know, an entire country. Um, does True. Lodestone just dump everything onto your phone or can you choose just Vancouver? You- yeah, you have to pretty much, well, main, at the moment, the, the primary limitation to this particular server is, well, my hard drive speed, because it's a 1.5 terabyte database for the entire world. So Whoa. you can't store everything on your phone. Right. And trying to pull in, let's say, all the points, even for, let's say, Canada, would probably be too big, because there's the problem with the system now is it's the opposite problem that the Symbian version had. The Symbian version had a lack of publicly available data, now we're practically drowning in data, and it's almost too much. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm having to try to upgrade this point share server to try to keep up with the load because, yeah, the queries can take a while. And, yeah. So, so basically what you want to do is, is pull in data for your local area. So then even for, let's say, a city like Vancouver, you might have 250,000 points. So then is the smartphone always... City. So is the smartphone yeah. then always trying to connect to your server to gather the information surrounding you? No, it's the one thing with Lodestone is that it does not necessarily require you to have a data plan to keep it running. The idea is that you, if you know where you are, so, so for example, if you know you're traveling in the Metro Vancouver area all the time, you then load the data when you have connectivity. And that way, when you're out on the road, you don't need to be running, let's say, your right. data plan or trying to hook into a Wi Fi. Okay. Right. So your navigation system isn't just going to pack up and leave should all the cellular networks go down on you, it'll still keep running. Right. Okay. Which is kind of good for me because, well, I don't have a cellular data plan because the rates in Canada, as we know, are a bit ridiculous sometimes. <laughs> Just a tad. <laughs> yeah. So that's one of the key features is, yeah, you load the thing once and then you, yeah, it's it's going to be with you until you decide to update the data again. Okay. And you talked about sharing points with other users. How is, how is that procedure done? There's a... Basically, in the program, you can click a button to upload your database of points. It basically says send to point share, and it will upload the points you have saved into the system into the database. So that way, anyone else can, downloading points can pull those points in. And that's, of course, you've marked it as a private point that isn't necessarily shared with the public. It's only for your own use. So it helps build up the map of, of things that may not be in the system yet. Is there a way of knowing like what's on the system already? Like if I was to go for a walk with my wife and go to a, a, a little known coffee shop just down the street here that may or may not be in your points of interest. Yeah, you can, if you've loaded the data for the, for let's say the city that you're in, you can explore around. There's an actual uh, show neighborhood function. So you can actually look at the points in your area cool. and you can do point searches. So you can kind of explore what's around you and see various things. 
And the other thing with this system that's a bit unique is that you can store not just the point's name and coordinates, but you can store everything about a point, anything and everything. You can store if the system, if it has a URL, so you can go to its website, or if it has a phone number you could call, or any other type of information you may want to know. Like, for example, I've stored in all the local transit information, so if you come across a bus stop, in that point's details, it'll tell you what buses stop there. Oh, slick. Yeah, so it's actually quite useful in that respect. It's interesting because, you know, like I mentioned earlier, Rob and I came from an iPhone use right. and are now Android users, but I pulled up my iPhone 5, 5C last night to charge it up and went to the App Store and looked at Lodestone and I went, Ten ninety nine. I just want to try it. <laughs> is, oh, right. is there a way of trying a product? Um, not really. Unfortunately, as far as I know, I don't think Apple will. You could do it. I guess you could make a trial version and make it somewhat freeware. But I've never been able. I've never really liked those programs because it's basically once you have it on the. It's only a technical limitation that's keeping you from using the full version. Okay. Right. Right. And unfortunately, with Apple products. In order to do the development, you really have to pay to play. So sure. I had to put a price tag on this one to, well, keep up with the costs. Yeah, no, I just wanted to look at it because I don't travel independently. Yeah. You know, I travel with my wife pretty much everywhere or Rob or somebody else. And so it's like, well, I, you know, I just can't justify it because I'm not going to use it. But at the same time, it would be interesting to actually pull it down and just explore my neighborhood and actually see what is around me because I don't have a clue. Well, that way and you could help the sighted person out because sometimes they don't have a clue. Sometimes you think they should, but it's surprising. <laughs> That's true. Now, do you have, like, turn-by-turn -turn navigation? Can I use it in the car with my wife as the navigator? It's, the turn-by-turn -turn isn't in yet. I'm actually planning that for probably the next release because, unfortunately, that thing, that's an, an online function. Right. But I know a lot of people would like that particular function. So, yeah, I think it will be going in on the next release. I've just sometimes I find the turn by turn navigation it may generate routes that no sane person would want to use. Right. <clears throat> but it is a feature I know that a lot of people want, so yeah, I'll, it'll definitely be in there. It just allows the blind person if they're traveling in a car with, you know, a, a sighted driver, yeah. the ability to help them navigate or get from point A to point B, I think. So Yeah, yeah exactly. What the system has right now is if you find points of interest, you can actually mark them off and then it will let you know as you approach and arrive at the points. Right. So yeah, you can actually so you can actually track a point and tell someone that yeah they're getting close or they should turn at some point. Okay. Yeah. So what is your development cycle like? Are you releasing once a year, twice a year? It's no, no. It's much quicker than that. It's actually since it's a fairly new product, it only it was only launched in July. It's being released almost as needed. So I have a group of beta testers that are volunteers. They're also my language translators, since Bloodstone is in multi-languages. Right. And yeah, we test the program and if bugs are found and new features and just trying out new things. And then once we've tested that for a little while, and yeah, then another release comes out. So it can be every, I don't know, every couple of months maybe at right. this point. And are you, are you looking for beta testers? <clears throat> um, at the moment, I have about 18 or 20, so mm -hmm. not really, unless someone has a lot of, like, they can contribute something significant or want to translate the program into another language. Correct. That's kind of what would, what's what's needed now is a few more language translators. Right. So what else sets your, your product apart from other ones like, you know, just the Maps app on iPhone or Sendero's GPS or some of the others that are on the market? Well, the big one is that the lack of, of it, the requirement for a data plan, you can keep using it without that. And right. the fact that it's it's only developed, well, me being totally blind, it's developed for the blind and with accessibility in mind. Right. So there's no fancy graphics. There's It's it's a text interface all the way along. So you know it's going to work with voiceover and, and speech in general. It, and it is a lot more, I think, more customizable than some of these products. You can configure, you know, what it, what type of uh, output is for each point, or the order that fields are spoken, and that kind of thing. Okay, it's very configurable. And there's probably more features I've forgotten about. <laughs> 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 well, and I mean, you know, the and the price point is is fantastic. I mean, it's definitely reasonable for sure. You, you know, uh, yeah, I had to kind of figure out, you know, knowing I have to know my audience. Not some 
uh, visually impaired people just don't have a lot of cash. So I didn't want to put it up too high. But on the other hand, with Apple pulling off 30% off the top of my fee, I also didn't want to be making absolutely nothing to pay the bills either. So right. I thought that was a pretty good price point. And, you know, maybe on the year anniversary, I'll bring it down to a, like, maybe I'll have a promo or something for cheaper. I don't know. I haven't decided that yet. Well, and I think, you know, one of the main blindness GPS apps on Android anyway that I keep hearing about is Nearby Explorer. And, oh, okay. you know, I believe that's like $100. Wow. So, yeah. I, and that seems, to me anyway, seems like a bit much. Yeah, I guess it all depends on the feature set that's built in, right? If you just need to get from point yeah. A to point B, you know, product A may be all you need. But if you need turn by turn and you need points of interest and you need, you know, all these other bells and whistles, that price yeah. might be justifiable. Yeah, maybe. See, I like to build programs with all kinds of bells and whistles and try to make them affordable. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> as many as I can get in there. Well, making I want to make the system powerful, but still easy to use from the user standpoint. Right. And this version, the iOS version of Lodestone, I think is a lot easier to use than the Symbian one back in the day. That one had some uh, quite a few issues just from the technical limitations of the time. So you talked about, you know, probably in, in, in your next, you know, update or next rollout, including the turn-by-turn -turn navigation. Is there anything else that you, your users are asking you for that you, know, you can share with us? Um, there's always little tweaks. And, of course, with the latest release of iOS 11 has introduced its own troubles into the system. So we're having to deal with that at the moment. There's a couple of glitches that aren't working properly. So it's usually a question of addressing bugs or if I've come up with something like some useful feature that I want to want in the system, then you know I might include it. Like right now, I want to have it monitor to if let's say if I want to monitor a certain point category to know like if I was walking along and wanted to know every bus stop I passed, for example, I want to put in a feature like that. But I don't know if that'll go in the next version or not. Right. But, that but is so far, the users seem to be. I, I think they're happy because they're not complaining. So I can only assume that they're all right. <laughs> That's right. No news. Usually, you know, because they will say things if things aren't working or there's some feature that's desperately needed in the program. And so, your product is it basically available worldwide? Yes, it's as far as I know. The app stores worldwide, as as far as Apple lets it go, will yeah. So it and it's translated into multiple languages, so it's available in quite a few areas. Uh, how many languages is it available in? Uh, what do we have here? Six or eight? There's yes. like, you know, there's interesting ones like Arabic and Polish and Turkish, Russian, Italian, Portuguese. There's other ones too that I've forgotten so, here. So and what... they're done by the volunteer translators. Wow. So and that's a pretty good base already. And so, and obviously yeah. more, more on its way. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, because and then some of these translations, depending on the translator's abilities, have been done to varying degrees. But yeah, for the most part, they're quite complete. So anybody looking to be a, a translator for you, they can yeah, reach out to you. Log on to the website. There's ex there's all the information on there, along with well everything else about Lodestone is on the main Lodestone website. All right. Well, hey, uh, speaking of that, then let's uh, let everybody know where exactly they can find Lodestone, both on the uh, on the web as well as in the App Store. In the, all right. It, the main website is www.lodestone-gps.com, and Lodestone is L-O-A-D-S-T-O-N-E. And if you type the word Lodestone into the App Store, you should also get that as the first hit. And so. Uh, is there anything else that you're currently working on, or are you specifically just focused on Lodestone? Um, right now I have a, a little side project, actually, to do with uh, TransLink here in Vancouver. Oh, really? And the idea is a friend of mine knows someone who is talking to TransLink about equipping bus stops with beacons. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. To use iBeacon technology so that you could find, so the GPS could, let's say, pull you into the bus stop, but does that extra few feet that you want to find that exact pole. So we're thinking to put beacons on each one of these things. Right. So I'm playing around with writing the program that will run you know, these beacons. Yeah, that's... that's... The, the cool thing with the beacons that we're playing with is they actually have a beeper. So you could send a command from the app to the beacon that will cause the pole to beep. Wow. So you could locate it. Right. So 
but whether or not this project goes anywhere, I, I can't exactly be promising any, anyone will have this. I don't know because that'll be up to TransLink at the end of the day. Yeah, for sure. Well, just be- the technology is interesting. Yeah, mm-hmm. Beacon technology is, does certainly seem to be up and coming, and there's, there's a few players in that field. Uh, we, talked to, we talked to an Israeli company called Right Here oh. that, that uh, is doing similar things with, with Beacons. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's, an, it's an interesting concept to solve that indoor GPS navigation problem. Yes, absolutely. yeah, absolutely, for sure. And I think that that's, that's where, you know, it's, it's really going to um, be um, applicable. Um, you know, so it's, it's great. Once this Galileo satellite system gets up and running and, and beacon technology uh, becomes, you know, more prevalent, you're literally going to be able to just use GPS to navigate from your, from your living room Rate to the, um, you know, produce aisle in your in your local save on. That would be really cool. Unfortunately, the beacon technology, at least the way Apple is marketing it, it was mar- it was designed more as a marketing aid for companies, not as an accessibility aid. You should so look. The at- trick is that the, the if companies have beacons, let's say it's a private database of them, so nobody knows that they're there until you run their app. Right. Yeah. 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 Right. It's as if everyone had telephones, but there were no public telephone directories. <laughs> True enough. But it, but it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting to see what whether or not they sort of clue into that and realize that yeah, this could be a, a real breakthrough in terms of uh, of a mobility aid um, for, oh, for for sure. the visually impaired. Hopefully they do. Um, you know, and you know, it's, it won't be the first time that that mainstream technologies have sort of. Um, you know, sort of realized the AT potential for for different technologies and and jumped on it. So hopefully, oh, yeah, hopefully that's hopefully. not the case. Well, the nice thing with the beacon technology as well as a blind user is I could be you know having my phone out, walking down the sidewalk, come to a storefront entrance, and my beacon could tell me this entrance is closed temporarily. It's under construction. Please use you know entrance on right side of building. Yeah, you, know. you can have all kinds of stuff in there. Exactly. Unfortunately, the beacon it, it, the beacon itself doesn't actually broadcast anything except a number, and then the the app itself has to look up in a database what that number corresponds to. Right. So yeah, <clears throat> a lot of these things would need to have real time data access, I think. But other than that, it would work pretty well. Yeah, for sure, and it would also require you know whatever you know the store or whatever to to, to update you know, that to and... keeping you know yeah keeping all yeah. that information up to date and relevant and yeah. you know that's going to mean man hours for somebody, so yeah, exactly. and, and a cost <clears throat> to the business. So it, I guess it all depends. At the end of the day, it's going to depend on them to whether or not they are they're going to deem that as a as a you know a worthwhile cost for them as a business. So yeah. That's a, yeah, that's exactly what that is. Yeah, same thing with this TransLink project. It would be up to them to keep the databases updated. But, you know, hopefully businesses and other things will see the potential in this and start doing it. You know, either that or they just go a different route and just, you know, crowdsource uh, the, the database, you know, so that you, yeah. know, you can put user points in. Um, yeah, you know. exactly. Unfortunately, though, Apple in their, I don't know if I would call it wisdom, <laughs> has made that part a little tricky because you can't just have your phone scan for a beacon in your area. You have to kind of know what you're looking for for some reason. Hmm. Yeah, and I think yeah. that's I think that's going to change, you know, like we've got the I hope so. We've got iBeacons, we've got the beacons from right here. You know, there's other companies out there who are are playing around with beacons and, you know, there's slowly like the right here beacon software also works they have their own app. But it also right. works with Blind Square, and I think you know at some point there's there's going to be a standard developed so that you don't have to have 15 different beacon apps on your phone. Your phone yeah, will just be. I would a, hope so. <laughs> it'll be another notification that pops up on your phone saying, you know, beacon nearby. Would you like to open the app or something similar? Yeah. Whereas it's kind of it works the other way, or at least on the iPhone right now, you have to have. That the app has to know exactly what uh, subset of beacons it's scanning for before it'll do anything. Right. But, you know, that opens up a whole other can of worms. I mean, it was, it was funny. Before we brought you on, we were having a discussion about an about, uh, uh, article in the Globe and Mail about, about smartphones and how it's kind of damaging, <laughs> da- damaging us as a society and damaging our brains in terms of how, much, <laughs> how, much, how many notifications that we get pushed. And the idea of beacon technology being used for marketing evil 
<laughs> like oh, you, can't, you wouldn't even be able to walk down the street without, you know, hey, Old Navy is having a sale. Yep. You're, no, you're within I, I, 160 feet. I would hate feet. that idea of, yeah, having it suddenly your phone is broadcasting ads. No, no, that, yeah, yeah. I can see someone wanting to do this, but that would be a, yeah, that'd be the worst use of it, this technology. It, it would be, and that, the cynic in me just thinks, okay, well, that's this certainly going to happen then. If, if Oh, it is. That's probably yeah. going to be the first implementation of this technology. Yeah, that's absolutely. And you'd so, be walking through the mall. Maybe that's the reason Apple's limited the thing, so that the app has to know what to scan for, so it's not just wide open and having it blast away at everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think you're absolutely right. I think that that's certainly a, a concern because... Because I think people were trying, at least back in the old Nokia days, when you could broadcast things via Bluetooth to phones, I think a few things were trying to do that, ad-based things. I know in Metro Town here one day, I actually did get a re receive a Bluetooth ad on my Nokia phone, which I thought was very strange. Wow. Well, yeah. It's coming. Yep. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> the storm. Winter is coming, my friends. <laughs> Anything that we didn't bring up that you want to talk about? I think we've pretty much covered everything. Of course, I'll think of something later in the day when we're offline, but that's okay. <laughs> but of course, so will we. <laughs> that's what websites and social media feeds are for, you know, with the Twitter feeds and all that. You can update people now. That's true. Well, you know what? Okay, let's let's just go through the whole list of uh, where people can actually find you. Give the website again, your your Facebook page, sure. anything. Yep, the, the website is uh, www.lodestone-gps.com. And from there, you'll find all of the, the Facebook links. There is a Facebook page and a Twitter page. And um, there's YouTube videos, various tutorials about how to use the program and just other, you know, updates from me and whatnot. And uh, our webmistress, Christy Cassie, keeps everything up to date. Wonderful. And she's in charge of, of the social media feeds and will probably put out an update about when this podcast will be available. Great. Yep. And, uh, yeah, so that's where the latest and greatest news for Lodestone is, is on the website. Everything we do is sort of funneled to that one place. And for, for anyone who's interested in, in purchasing the app, it's available on the App Store, and it's oh, currently, yeah. how much is it? It's currently 10.99 Canadian, so it, it'll translate that into whatever your local currency is. Dirt, dirt cheap, everybody. Dirt cheap. Yes. And there, oh yes, I should mention that there is a GoFundMe campaign that can be accessed from the, the Lodestone website as well. And that is to update the Lodestone point share server for higher speeds. Because right now, downloading the mapping data can actually take a while. And it's not because of a slow network, it's because of a slow hard drive. Got it. So I've try, I'm trying to update the hardware for that, which is proving a bit expensive <laughs> uh hey sean thanks so much for uh taking some time out of your day and chatting with us oh you're welcome and thank you for having me on thanks sean Take right. care. Woo, woo, woo. you know it's interesting because you know gps they've always re relied on you know magellan had theirs and their mapping and tom toms had their mapping and you know every product has their own source for maps and he's tapping into an open source you know idea and that could be really powerful yeah, you know, and initially when, when you first booked them and when I first started thinking, about it, I was like, wow, like really uh, somebody who's developing, you know, a sort of an independent GPS app seems seems like a bit of an uphill battle because there's just so many GPS options out there. But mm -hmm. the thing that, that makes this stand apart uh, is that it's, you know, it's it's designed by somebody who's visually impaired for the visually impaired. So. It, it's gonna it, it, you know if you're using a screen reader you know it's rock solid and it's gonna work in every aspect and you know I'm not real familiar with GPS apps because I don't travel independently but I I think just being able to upload your own points of interest to the server let's say I'm traveling in Italy somewhere yeah. you know and there's a, a point of interest I want to mark that's now accessible to somebody else that's right that's pretty cool yep yeah and it's nice the, the you know the, it, the the one thing about about sort of the built-in uh, GPS apps is that one, it's they're really they're really rough on your battery. I know that you know if I turn on Google Maps, uh, it kills my battery like nothing. And that's because nothing's stored on your phone. It's going that's right, the and cloud it's and and not to mention the bandwidth, the, right. the, the you know the the data that it that it uses up. So um, there's that advantage as well. So I know highly recommend anyone who is interested in checking it out. Go to the app store and uh, and give it a spin for eleven bucks Canadian, which I don't know American. That's like 
you know, 50 cents. I don't, <laughs> I don't know what the exchange rate is now, but. Right. Support your blind developers. But yeah, no, absolutely. You know, this guy's working, Sean's working hard, working hard for many years. I can't believe he goes all the way back to the Nokia phones. Yep. God, that was a nightmare. I remember, <laughs> I remember literally we, it took, it would take three hours to get that damn Sometimes Bluetooth to GPS. And... It got to the point where I would like shiver whenever I heard the word <laughs> Bluetooth because it, the pairing was just a nightmare at the beginning. It's so gotten so much better. Yeah. So much better. It's got, it's night and day. Yeah. Now it's nothing. You, you just take it for granted that, you know, something's Bluetooth enabled, no problem. You just connect to it. Yeah. Uh, but man, it did not used to be like that. Nope. That flashing blue light, man. <laughs> it sucked. Has it found it yet? Has it found it yet? That's right. Nope. Oh, let's reset it. Oh, <laughs> we did that already. Reset it again. Yeah, we took we took many walks around the block yep. around the the CNI building, CNIB building, uh, where we used to work, where Roga the Roga offices used to be, just trying to get that damn just um, test it and play with it GPS and, yeah. receiver working. Hey Ryan, Rob, where can people find us? Well, again, we are in the Guitar Dungeon, but online they can find us at www.atbanter.com. They can also email us if they so desire at atbanterpodcast at gmail.com. They can also find us on Facebook at atbanter or on Twitter, at underscore banter. That's right. And Instagram, I forget what our what our username is, but <laughs> I, I'm sorry. The Instagram, we're working on it. Yeah, we're working it's, on it. it's, it's a, a tough one. It is. A, it's, a, it's, it's a bit of a tough one. We need, we need you know, we need to do the duck face a lot. We well, and it looks like, you know, like post I, pictures of our food. I got my Instagram reset up again and I'm following some family and stuff. And, you know, it, it, it definitely looks like it's not all photos, you know, some people it's are not just posting stuff, right? No, it so. is. Well, and they say that that's the big, that's the next big marketing, uh, platform that, that people are using to, to sort of actively market is, um, is Instagram. And there are people that do like videos and tutorial videos and right. stuff like that on, on their Instagram and uh, have have can get really pretty big followings. So it's just a uh, matter of wrapping your mind around it. You know, guys our age, we're not, we don't pick up on the latest technology, nope. especially with the social media stuff. And now after after today, I don't even know, even know if I want another <laughs> to get to delve into another social media platform. Oh, I know. I look at the social media. Just one more thing to buzz. I look at the social folder I have on my phone, and there's Facebook, there's Twitter, there's Inst or Instagram, there's WhatsApp, there's, you know, four or five different social apps that I check almost daily. And oh, I know. Too much. And you know, it the notifications do get annoying. Like I noticed, even Twitter. Twitter used to be where I would get a notification for the for the AT Banter podcast feed if somebody like no like messaged us or talked about us or responded to a tweet yeah uh but now i get notifications if somebody we're following tweets something <laughs> right like so i'm constantly getting these these notifications that have nothing to do with with our channel right. and it's it's pissing me off well you should be able to set that because the only probably the only notifications i get from twitter are when we get a new follower yeah the, and, and that must be what it, it must just be a they've changed the yeah the default settings or something so yeah. Telling you, they're making us stupider. You think, yeah, probably. I don't know. I'm seriously, I'm, I'm seriously considering that whole phone-free day. Yep. I think I might try that. I'll let you know though beforehand, so that you know. So I can just, well, you gotta get. Just Google. email me. I, I'll check my computer. You gotta Google Home, so I can still call you. All right. Yeah, that's that's true. Yeah, actually, I might check to see what they're what what Best Buy is selling them for. It's right a nice now. backup phone my, system. It's my just twenty-five want to turn bucks. Your phone off. Or on your phone, keep your phone live, but just turn your data off. You won't get your notification. Well, you'll get your Wi-Fi, so yeah. You, know, you can just turn Wi-Fi off. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I guess you could make it so that... Yeah, that's good. That's true. That's yeah. true. You still have your phone. Just turn your data and your Wi-Fi off. I don't know, but there's something more rewarding. <laughs> it's more tangible to just be like, my phone is in a, a drawer. Yep. I'm not even anywhere around it. Because it is. It's a psychological thing yep. as much as you just feel naked without your phone. And that's a weird... It's a weird thought. It is. Let's go back to rotary phones and answering <laughs> machines. Remember that? Those are the good old days where yeah. you'd just be sitting in your living room and your phone would ring and you'd let it go to the machine and be like, okay, yeah, I don't want to talk to them. So. 
Call screening. And they couldn't, they wouldn't know. They couldn't call you on it because they wouldn't be like, I knew you were home. Yeah, that's right. I mean, they kind of could, but they, and it's not like texting where people are just like, you know, they, they just know that you always have your phone on you. So yeah. if they text you and you don't answer, you're ignoring them. Yep. And it's even worse for iPhone. Like, I feel bad for people who have like stuff like iMessage mm -hmm. where it actually shows if the other person has read your message. Oh, does it really? Oh, yeah. Oh, interesting. Oh, Man, back when I, I had a friend like that, when uh, I used to have my iPhone that had an iPhone as well, and when they, when they first introduced that iMessaging system, and they were so annoying because they'd be like, they'd text and I'd read it and be like, okay, I'll get back to them. And they'd be like, why haven't you answered my text? <laughs> like, you've read it. Why aren't you getting back to me? What's the deal? Wow. And it's just like, man, they just, oh, that's funny. people just assume they have just like 24-7 access to you at yeah. at all times with... Ugh, oh, it's, well. it's kind of been our anti-smartphone episode. It has been. I don't know. This article really opened my eyes. Well, we can do a follow-up. We should. You know, it might that actually might be uh, worth an entire episode talking about. Yep. Um, Just diving into it. Yeah, maybe, maybe. I don't know. I don't know how interesting it'll be for for people who actually tune in for for uh, Real AT guess. news and. <laughs> They want to hear us old guys railing Complaining against about smartphones and technology. It's true. Uh, oh. Who knows? Anyways, all right. Well, uh, I think that's going to about do it for us this week. Yeah, I should probably get back to work. Yeah, that's right. Working boy. Yep. Thanks everybody so much for listening in once again. I have been Rob Mino for those people who are just joining us. And I'm Ryan Flurry. And that's been Mr. Cowbell, <laughs> and uh, we will see everybody next week. This podcast has been brought to you by Canadian Assistive Technology, providing low vision and blindness solutions across Canada. Find us online at www.canastech.com. That's C-A-N-A-S-S-T-E-C-H dot com. Or call us toll-free at 1-844-795-8324. For all your assistive technology servicing needs, call Chaos Technical Services at 778-847-6840 or find them online at chaostechnicalservices.com. Music provided by bensound.com.